Hey there, my name's Mark McCartney and welcome to the What Is A Good Life podcast. Over the last two years, I've interviewed over 150 people around this question, not to provide you with the universal answer, but to help you find and define your own answer to this question. While I'm also trying to share with you what I perceive to be more genuine expressions of the human experience. On the 24th episode of the What Is A Good Life podcast, I'm joined by Robbie Stamp, who is the CEO of BIOS International, a senior fellow at the Resilience and Sustainable Development Program at Cambridge University, chairman of Happened Here, and was an executive producer on the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy feature film. In this episode, we discuss the quality of paying attention, becoming okay with not knowing, appreciating all phenomenological and conscious experiences, the mirror AI holds up to us, and the limitations AI will have for accounting for all human experience, and how there will always be a tension between creative and destructive behavior, both internally and externally. This episode will help you appreciate the messiness of being human, feel more comfortable with uncertainty and the paradoxes of life, exhibit more compassion for us all while striving to improve, and to cultivate some humility around the limitations of your knowledge and indeed your own perspective. Look, I enjoyed this conversation immensely. This interview with Robbie was one of my favorite to date, and I certainly took a lot from it, as I'm sure you will too. And if you enjoy this conversation, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you're on the podcasting platforms, please leave reviews as well, as I'd greatly appreciate your support at this stage of my podcasting journey. So without further ado, the 24th episode of the What is a Good Life podcast. Robbie, thank you very, very much for joining me here on the What is a Good Life podcast today. As I said, I've uh, I've watched a TED talk of yours recently and I've read some articles in which you were interviewed in. And I, I was really looking forward to this conversation based on what I perceive to be the kind of nuance of your thinking. Um, and just you, you struck me as someone who I'd really enjoy interviewing around this question. Well, Mark, thank you very much indeed for having me on. It's 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 a pleasure, and it's a it's a pleasure to be meeting you. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm hugely looking forward to this. I really am. Wonderful. Well, Robbie, as I tend to kick these conversations off with, it's with the question of: Is there a question you're trying to answer as you move through life? Yeah, and I've been thinking very hard about trying to what that. I don't know whether it's a question. I think that I wanted to start with with one phrase, which is maybe saying I'm learning to try and do, which is learning to pay attention. What does it mean to pay attention? Uh, we were having a, a little conversation about, at my advanced age, starting to listen to birdsong and listening to try and distinguish what for your average proper Twitcher, bird watcher, they'd be thinking, mate, this is what we've been doing all of our lives. But the joy I'm taking in starting to be able to distinguish a wren from a chaffinch, from a blue tit, from a robin, from a blackbird, from a missile thrush. As I say, don't please start playing any of them to me and putting me on the spot <laughs> because I would probably fail massively. <laughs> but that would be a good lesson in humility. So I think that, that 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 joy, what does it mean to pay attention? To pay attention uh, to one's surroundings, to the sound that the wind makes in trees at different times of the year because the leaves are of different qualities. What what does it mean to pay attention to how similar the sound of wind in trees can be to water breaking on pebbles? And also then what does it mean to pay attention internally to oneself, to what where one is thinking about why did that upset me? Why what, what, Why am I always, I've done this thinking, here I'm, I'm a man in my seventh decade, and there are certain things and certain times where I, I can feel like I'm, I'm upset, like I'm a, I'm a teenager again, and no matter how much I've thought and reflected and or even know why that particular thing upsets me, how fascinating it is that, and this is my, 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 my weaknesses, that I'm still not kind of able, always able to contextualize and get over it. So how does one pay attention to how one is responding in the world? And then critically, how does one pay attention deeply, deeply to others and deeply to the needs and the wants of others? And I thought if I could, I'd start with the closing verse of one of my favorite poems, um, which might sort of set this off. Um, it's a poem called Liberty by Edward Thomas. And Edward Thomas is my favorite poet. Um, I was introduced to him, as was my brother at school when we were teenagers. And Edward Thomas died in 1917, uh, in April 1917. He's not considered to be one of the war poets. 
he wrote all of his poems, I think I'm right, my brother would know for sure, 1914 to 1917, 200 poems. And uh, Mifanwi Thomas, who was his daughter, came in her 70s to read a poem that he'd written about her called Lad's Love, Old Man, which is a meditation on the nature of memory and regret. He watches her squat uh, on the step outside this little house in a place called Steep in Hampshire in the UK. And she crushes the, 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 this herb, which is growing outside called Lad's Love. And he thinks, I wonder what she'll remember when she smells that in the future. So she came to our school and she told stories about Edward Thomas and read Old Man. And I was just completely hooked from then on in. And actually, relatively recently, a few years ago, my brother and I went on a little pilgrimage to Steep and we we found the house. It's empty now, but the plant is still growing on the doorstep. We took a tiny little cutting and took it and put it on his grave in Anyi. He's buried in a, in a war grave cemetery in, in Anyi. So this poem means a great deal to me. It's called Liberty. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it is a poem where the poet is to start with classically meditating on the nature of regret. Um, and he's talking about, you know, all the time I've spent wasting regretting, I had piled before me. Uh, I should be rich to be so poor. And then for Thomas, who could be very hard on himself. He was bipolar. He could be very hard on himself. He was clearly not an easy person to live with. His wife, Helen Thomas, has written a very beautiful book called As It Was. Uh, and he was he could clearly be difficult. When, when the black dog came and got him, it was hard. So he's doing a, a, a classic piece of meditation on the nature of regret, regret. And then this is these last four lines, which I've kept coming back to many times in my life. And yet I still am half in love with pain, with what is imperfect, with both tears and mirth, with things that have an end, with life and earth, and this moon that leaves me dark within the door. Hmm. So to finish up that really profound question or the meditation reflecting on that question, is there a question? I suppose it's compassion for the messiness of human beings. We are messy, glorious, kind, cruel, joyous, strange, weird creatures. And it's compassion for that messiness. And what that means in terms of paying attention to the wider environment, to birdsong, to trees, to the sound of wind, to light playing on water. It's a beautiful Anglo-Saxon word for that, fealo, fealo. So I think those are my slightly long answer to what am I what am I thinking about? Have I thought about this for a lot of my life? I think probably I have in different guises. Pay attention and compassion for messiness. Well, that's... Uh, I, I could end this right here and I'd be very satisfied with this uh, with this conversation. That's... Um, oh, so where to begin, I guess? the The sense of... Even just this expression, half in love with pain. Mm. Um, I, I think there's something, and even just what you said about, like, you know, you're in your seventh decade and you're still, you can still find yourself responding to things that, like, uh, like you might, you might have a teenager as a teenager. And it's not that you haven't thought about life or reflected on your behavior or considered where these things came from. There's something really beautiful about this and that. I'm starting to think in my experience that as much as we're trying to change and corral ourselves into this, you know, maybe per, like best version of ourselves or something to that effect, we don't get there before we like have peace with our totality. Like the, there's an acceptance of what is as it arises. If you get me, because I, I don't know, there's something we have this category, we kind of categorize these things as good and bad or light and dark. And as you say, I, I see really good people do some, some pretty unbelievable things like into the opposite of it. And I see some quite bad people, you know, that are considered bad people that are capable of genuine moments of love and affection. I, I don't know, like I'm, I'm starting to think that it's, it's not about fixing everything. It's, can you accept that this is some way part of the, the human experience? I think, I think that 
one of the things I've certainly been trying to do, and I have been trying to do this, it's co- I'm conscious of trying to do this, is trying to avoid now universalizing my own experience into some kind of universal truth. Now, I know I I spent five or six minutes thinking about and reflecting doing that. So I want to sort of caveat a lot of what I say by being very aware that um, of the dangers of of universalizing these things. But I, I worry sometimes about some of the modern this idea of, you know, endless articles about be your best self, five ways to be your best self, three things to do, three habits to change, uh, all of those things which we're fed. And I wonder whether or not they they create, there is no doubt that they will create moments of flow, of joy, of connection, of, of any number of the things where we feel where this is a good day, this is a good moment, this is a good afternoon, but both sort of sometimes self-inflicted and then other times externally inflicted. You know, the loss of a loved one, a friend who's had a bad day, uh, any number of really, you know, the, the smaller challenges and the bigger challenges can accidentally come into our life, the role of luck and the role of bad luck and environment. And I, I think that when people sort of, feel that there's a a permanent nirvana state to be in, in this messy, fleshy, contradictory space we live in as human beings. And that if you're not there, somehow this is another thing you're failing at. It's another thing you're failing at. I mean, some of the people I've seen struggle, and I'm really careful here, who've been away, you know, on a fabulous retreat and they've, they've had the epiphany and they've, 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 they've been through something really cathartic and really meaningful. And it may be well have changed some of the fundamental ways they think. And it may be very long lasting. But also there are times where they go back and they meet their first passive aggressive colleague again. And it, somehow all that stuff went out, goes out the window. And then they're thinking, oh my goodness, was that moment where, you know, I told that story I'd never dared tell anybody before and I was supported and loved and cared for, or, you know, I wept before the beauty of a dawn, or, you know, I, I did choose to walk barefoot in the hills for the first time since I was a toddler or walking around without any shoes on. Whatever you decided to do, which was meaningful, those things both were meaningful, they had real moment. You can be with them. You can go and find them in your life again. You can find them through meditation. You can find them through all sorts of memory. But there will be other things that will come and will challenge you. And kind of that's all right too because it's going to happen. And so I think there's this deep paradox, and I think about this a lot. Um, I think I had you know, one relatively, a brush of quite serious illness in my life. Uh, when I had cancer, I had kidney cancer, so I've only got one kidney, and it came out of the blue. It was a storm that that came up, as far as I was concerned, out of nowhere. It was diagnosed accidentally. And in the recovery from it, that fascinating, endless balance, and I think this will be something I'll be working on till my dying day, is that mixture of being kind to oneself and being tough with oneself. And how yeah. one finds that balance, how one you know, allows oneself to be, I I remember, I mean, one of the ways of of thinking around this is around the language we use around cancer, for example, the classic little language around fighting cancer. So if somebody famous gets cancer, there'll be an article and somebody in their entourage will say something along the lines of, well, if anybody's got the strength to fight this, then enter name of celebrity here, so-and-so has. Yeah. As if by correlatively there are a bunch of moral pygmies out there who aren't made of the right stuff who are in lily livered fashion going to succumb to this thing now in the immediate aftermath of my cancer i was quite militant about this now my, my view would have changed a little bit if i as the person who's got the problem choose to use that language bring it on I'll fight with you. I'll help you. What can I do to help? But what I cannot do is impose that language on somebody else. I mustn't say you must fight this. You'll fight this. All right, you can fight it. It's all in the mind. Those kind of things. And again, probably now I was crosser 
15 years ago if, if I felt people being unkind. And now I probably, they're, mel they're, they're meaning well. They're not meaning to be unkind. But if somebody says, you know, it's in the mind, it's really important to stay positive, I kind of know that. But if I'm having an afternoon of pain or fear, and then somebody's saying, yeah, you're making the little buggers divide more quickly, that isn't really very helpful or kind. So I think there's this deep, endless paradox in our lives between acknowledging the the moments where one does try and need to try and get one out of a moment of overwhelm those moments where all where things coalesce around you and that's what overwhelm is and how you start to pick and unbraid them again and unweave them again and yet being gentle it's you're just not going to live a life where you don't get angry where you're not hurt where you haven't felt the pain of unrequited love where you just wouldn't be drinking deeply enough at life if you didn't um so i i think that's that paradox it's one of the many paradoxes that we might talk about today but that one that that and it, i think it's it's gently and endlessly the journey we're on yeah it's um I, th I think you said this really beautiful idea of just uh, being kind enough to yourself and being forceful almost uh, or hard on yourself enough, like, because I think that's the great challenge in life. I think we're, we're trying to latch on to, and this probably is what spawns some of the, you know, the top five tip uh, life hacks and so forth is because we're almost desperate to believe that there is a key to this life that makes it, you know, that makes it like, we approach life in the most optimal way possible. But I think the more I examine life or much, cause much like what you were saying at the start there, I I'm really trying to pay attention, like really trying to pay attention to myself and even just acknowledging sometimes that I seem to be a human that is curious and trying its best and its best can look very, very different from day to day. But then not letting that slide too far, the, the compassion to slide too far to the point where I, I, I almost stop, I stop seeking what could potentially, I don't know, reveal the next part of myself to myself and this, this discovery of life. I, I, so I, I wonder whether there kind of, there really is a, a there, there. <laughs> I mean, I know that there would be lots of religious traditions which would absolutely fundamentally disagree that there, you know, there are moments of emptiness and moments of, of utter belonging and, and loss of self and loss of sense of self and that beautiful enveloping a timeless enveloping in, uh, in, in, in the world, in space and time. Um, but I think in the more quotidian space where most of us live our days, uh, those issues are, they're just messy. They're contradictory. Uh, and what you're trying to do, what I try and do, is just try and nudge the dial towards the constructive aspects of who I am and try and mitigate, minimize the destructive. And that's an endless, you know, that I, I, I that, that's a work in progress. It's a work in progress in my seventh decade. And if I'm lucky enough to make it to my eighth, I'm sure it will be a work in progress then. And I, 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 I wanted to find, and I didn't, so this is rather useless, but I wanted to find the, the lines. There's some lines in the four quartets, I think, where Elliot talks about getting to middle age and maybe I'm even, I don't know, I think I'll still think of myself as middle aged rather than late middle aged, but you know that you kind of you're meant to get to this stage where aha wisdom i see it and i don't feel that way in fact if anything i feel less certain than i did i feel less certain than i did in in previous decades of my life i feel more self-doubt i feel more questioning not i hope in a in an endlessly narcissistic loop but just these the sense of these tiny islands of knowledge in a vast sea of unknowledge of ignorance and that bit i have come to peace with i'm all right with that i'm all right for all that i shall never know and that's all right and but there are these little islands but equally as my, my son was saying when i was kind of doing this shtick he said yes fatherly that's that's all right 
and it, he wasn't quite as tough on me as this, but he said, don't make it a humble brag either, because actually it's not authentic to say that I, I know nothing. It's because I authentic is not what I think about myself. So I kind of don't want to do the, yeah, the older I've got, the more I realize I know nothing stuff. And actually, yeah, I know some stuff. And I, 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 I there are some situations which I've encountered before and some times where maybe I'm able to provide some space for people who are in difficulty or trouble to talk them things through to be a sounding board and sometimes maybe it's helpful and sometimes it is so it's again there's a very good example of that balance that i'm always you know that that, that balance between it's genuinely i mean it in some ways i do feel less certain i am i know how much i don't know and i will never know but i take joy and pleasure in the things that i do and i mustn't as my son sam said it shouldn't he didn't actually use this language but i remember it very clearly he's always been that since he was a little boy he's been very good at calling me on stuff he, he <laughs> since he was he was a he was a little boy it's like if one got cross there was something he'd done if it kind of was fair enough it would be a fair cop i'll come quietly and if it wasn't we'd know about it and both my son and my daughter are, are, are very much like that I'm, I'm very 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 blessed in my 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 my, my children and i'm now a grandfather to um to a little boy leo as well and that that that, that those, those 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 kind of conversations and that's a good example of the paradox of being kind to oneself compassionate with oneself and sometimes tough on oneself and and uh, and not slipping into easy not slipping into easy I'm, I must say, I, I love I love the idea of being called out on this kind of idea of I know enough to know that I know nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I've definitely I've definitely lent on that uh, in a very egoic manner, uh, humbly at the start. I would say, like, oh my god, uh, there's so much that I don't know. And then I got a little bit uh, I got a little bit too comfortable with issuing that, uh, or I felt a little bit too proud of myself sometimes when issuing issuing that statement. When you mentioned there, just the idea of getting comfortable though with the uncertainty in life is is that something you've always had an appetite for if you get me or how have you kind of come into into peace with the uncertainty of either our nature or life and unfolding that's a really great question of course it's 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 difficult to know really it's a, it's a very good question of it's trying to one's reaching back now in some very beautiful well i can find the very beautiful ways in terms of memory and sense memory in these moments of so maybe 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 a way of maybe a way of answering that would be some things some childhood experiences some childhood memories one of them is is my father describing to me the concept of infinity now this will send mathematicians wild because i know this isn't really it but anyway for a child five or six year old this was very helpful so he said there's a there's a, imagine there's a um there's a, a stone a rock as big as our house and we lived in the ground floor of quite a big house in the countryside okay i can get that i can look there's the house and then imagine there's a bird like a a a a, 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 a little swallow or a, a, not a swallow a wren a robin in the garden and I can get, I say Robin, and once every hundred years, just about as a five or six year old, a hundred years, I just get, that's a very long time. And it flies up to the North Pole. Well, I like the North Pole. I'm interested in geography once every hundred years and sharpens its beak on a rock as big as the house. And when that rock is worn down to the size of one of these little stones in, 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 in the gravel here, one day of infinity will have passed. And that was enough for my five or six year old mind to go, oh my goodness, that's a very, 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 very long time. And sometimes I would lie in bed at night freaked out at the thought of being conscious for infinity in a conscious of nothingness forever. And that was a very, so kind of the idea of, of infinite, uncertain space was kind of something that I, I, in a way, I suppose I've been thinking about for a long, long time, being you know in 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 that space for a very long time, and thinking about those kind of things, and then thinking about what it means to know anything. I remember having a thought, one of those interesting moments when you're a child, and I was learning about the Battle of Waterloo, um, and I remember having the thought, which is, and I was about nine, something like that. You couldn't know what had happened at the Battle of Waterloo, really know it, unless you knew what every single soldier was thinking and doing for every moment of that battle, then you might know it. And I remember thinking, 
to oneself, and I hope this doesn't sound sort of smug, but as a nine, that's actually that's quite interesting, isn't it? What an interesting thought that is. Uh, yes, that is. And to this day, I suppose, I look back and I think, in a way, uncertainty, ineffability, mystery, in a way, the joy in not knowing, the fact that, you know, you can't predict the future. I mean, one of the things, you know, I, I also work in, you know, consultancy spaces, and I'm always really deeply sceptical about people talk about future-proofing things. Um <laughs> Now, you could maybe help people to be as resilient in the face of the, the challenges that have come in the future as possible. And there's probably quite a lot you can do to think about that. But the idea of future proofing is part of those very old fantasies at a larger scale that we were talking about at the personal scale, about perfectibility, about utopias, uh, about the state of perfection. And you can maybe reach for it in a Kaizen kind of a way, you know, learning that every single pen stroke is a, is, is a learning and a thing of the beauty as you learn your calligraphy and that lovely concept of, of kaizen in japan you can do that on a personal level and then at the larger scale yes uncertainty unknowability ineffability it, it all feels all right to me They're always not always comfortable in fact sometimes it's horrible it's frightening it's scary but it is what it is uh and and uncertainty is uncertainty and you know you can have one thing sitting in a space which you don't know we don't know about it and it's moved and now I know about it. I can see it. I can feel it. I'm more certain about it. But it doesn't mean the category has gone away. It's just that one thing that was sitting in the cloud of uncertainty, the cloud of unknowing has moved into a new space where I've got some lines of sight on it. But the category itself hasn't gone away. This is... Uh... I can imagine why you would have been so satisfied with that thought, particularly as a nine-year-old. Um, because this is... I don't know. This is... a. Uh... This is brilliant from the perspective, I think, of, was that quite a, I know you're recalling it now, was that quite a, like, influential or formative thought? Because we're talking about compassion. Like, I, I think something like that or, or something that is aware of, uh, or an observation like that makes us so aware of just the sheer complexity of trying to understand an outcome, a motivation, an experience, um, and almost just that kind of awareness of awareness of not knowing or humility in what you don't know, I think would be quite influential in terms of... That's a really good question. And I think actually, so you, you, you're making me think about it in a way I haven't maybe for a while. And I suppose implicit in that thought as I go back and try and feel that embody, embodied memory component, one of the most beautiful aspects of what it is to be human, this beautiful, fissile, reliable, unreliable, glorious memory that we, we have. And I go back into that and think part of that thought was it's really interesting and part of it at the same time is, and of course, that's impossible. <laughs> you couldn't yeah. know that you couldn't. So in a way, it was a, in order to know it, you'd have to, but actually you can't. And I kind of was all right with that paradox i suppose really uh, i was all right with that with the, with with that that you know epistemological question about what it means to know anything at all uh and then going yeah but of course you're never going to know that it's 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 not going to be it's not going to be possible all the things that are ineffable um and we may or may not talk about you know ai and the the, the you know the, the 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 questions and issues around the mirror it holds up to us what is knowable and what's not but i think that I had that thought, which was in order to, you'd need to, but you can't. And that is a paradox. Just when you, you mention it there, just in, in terms of your, could you elaborate even on that idea of just the, because uh, it's something that I'm really intrigued with, the idea of the the mirror that AI holds up to us. Where, where does your mind go in terms of that? Well, goodness, this is such a big issue at the moment, isn't it? I mean, the the as we, we have, the you know we're talking right now in the midst of you know the, the the growth of these these huge language models which have sort of put ai four square and center it's in the popular press everybody's thinking about it you've got some of the greatest ai you know researchers in the world writing articles in time magazine saying you know I, i'm here to tell you that if we don't mend our ways it's all going it, to it's going to kill us we're all going to die we're all going to die we're all going to die and that feels to me 
to have some fascinating, almost religious overtones. The the this idea of eschatology, the end of days. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a way of thinking about. It's a in fascinating that these very secular folks conjure up very religious imagery about a vengeful god that will create which will smite and smote and smite us again and send the frogs and the the, the, the boils and, and and the volcanoes and the eruptions and things after us so i think we're in the midst of a, a really fascinating moment where you know my original well my undergraduate degree was history and i've loved history all my life and i'm aware that at different stages of many, many societies, you could have gone back into the records and people felt they were living in uniquely turbulent, uniquely horrible, difficult, changing times. And indeed, one of the earliest poems we know of um, is a, a we found on on in, in from um, a Babylonian tablet, I think. And it goes some forgive me, I'm going to get this wrong probably, but it goes something like "Ure ure anam, mure mure anam." Gure gure anam. And what that means was is something like in 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 those days. Now it was in those nights. In those nights. No, in those days. Now it was in those days. In those nights. Now it was in those nights. In those years. Now it was in those years. So from about two and a half thousand BC, people are already going. Oh, it was a lot better when. <laughs> it was a lot better back yeah, then. Yeah. So we've been at this. You know, these things that are eternal in us, and these things that are changing. But I think from an historian's point of view, you can see that there is a confluence of things going on where we have our, our biologically evolved selves through 3.2 billion years of biological substrate evolution on this planet with all that that's meant in terms of the growth from affect and pain and feeling and nutrition and what's going to feed us, what's going to kill us and, and evolving you know, nervous systems, evolving brains, um, that astonishing, beautiful, my goodness, journey. We now have these very fundamental questions about what it is to be manifest in data space what is it for us to be held in ones and zeros in data space we're sold this idea of this comforting digital twin but philosophically ontologically what's going on there's nothing like that at all there's something right now there are essences of robbiness and essences of markness held in ones and zeros on server farms goodness knows where right now you and i in a way that does mean something, zipping through undersea cables, going through satellites, something about us out there in this space. And so I think there's some really fascinating things around boundary and boundary space that are shifting. But one of the things that I think about, and this sounds a little odd, but I, I, if I think back to some earlier things around earlier societies and things about the role of the shaman in societies, the shaman was the the intercessionary between this world, the world you know of that I can touch, you can touch right now, and other kinds of spirit realms. And they were the ones who went out and interceded on their village's behalf, on their society's behalf. And there were dangerous things out there. You could come to harm. You read the ethnic Africa accounts almost all over the world of what it was like to be that intercessionary. It was dangerous. You know, you needed to know what you were doing. And there's something about how what how do we now need the same intercessionaries in data space as where we're, we're, we're manifest in data space in this new way. So I think there's both, I feel, I want to sort of, I think thinking about the nature of human embodiment is a deeply political act because in a way, when and how did we allow a group of predominantly male Silicon Valley engineers to tell us what it is to be human. Uh, you know, what about the and, and, and the knowledge claims, the epistemological claims about omniscience that these things are about to have? Well, what knowledge? I mean, do you include the knowledge of back to the Waterloo experiment, the Waterloo thought experiment, or the knowledge of a of of of, of, a, of, of an Aboriginal Australian? song lines tracking with song and breath and body through the contours of land and tree and animal and myth and song uh or there's a very beautiful passage in, in a book called blackfoot physics by david peat where he talks about indigenous language structure and i think this is particularly that he talked about the Haida people and he says to hear the Haida people speak 
is to hear the slow-moving growl of a glacier from the last ice age. And I found that incredibly moving thought that you and I, with our voice boxes, we could, if we'd grown up in a different culture, be two people in time and space. And I would make a sound with my voice physiologically. And in it, you would hear me wanting for a reason to summon the feeling, the embodied sense, memory, and importance of a slow-moving growl of a glacier from the last ice age. And in this book, there's a Blackfoot elder who says when he needs to speak English, he knows he's going to have to speak English that day. He feels like he's having to put on a straitjacket because he's not going to be able to communicate what it means to subsist and be in a multiplicity of beautiful relationship in time and space. So the epistemological claims that are made for a lot of AI about all-knowing are deeply exclusionary. And either, folks, you mean omniscient, or you've got to go, well, no, that kind of knowledge doesn't matter. That So when I say knowledge, oh, no, I don't mean that kind of knowledge. I don't mean that kind of way of thinking about being. And that's, I think, in a way, even sort of with some Western logical excluded middle arguments, that really holds you below the waterline. So you've got to say, no, well, that knowledge doesn't matter. That way of subsisting, being being an embodied human in time and space doesn't matter is very different from saying it's going to know everything. So I think that thinking about the nature of human embodiment, memory, messiness complexity and for me some of the discourse goes back to the, again those fantasies about perfection because of our imperfections we'll get this thing which is the ultimate rational being ultimately rational ultimately able to scan in ways we can't now none of this by the way is to say that ai is not extraordinary and the, it will give us ways of seeing and acting in the world and seeing pattern and discovering relationship which could be so beneficial to us in so many ways but like anything we you know the emmanuel kant quote out of the crooked timber of humanity no true thing was ever made so <laughs> it will if we're well it will have to be always vigilant about where it reinforces, maximizes the constructive aspects of us and how we minimize its destructive capabilities. That's why I think human embodiment, thinking about it is political, whose knowledge, uh, who's included in the discourse, who's excluded from the discourse, who's included from the design, from the review, from the implementation. And then thinking, I think, about the components that are ineffable, and undescribable to be experiences that we have, which never get digitized, but are fundamentally important of who, how we are and how we spend our days. Very clear, I'm quite passionate about this. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, but you, you've touched on uh, you've touched on a number of um, kind of fascinating components. The one thing there, when you were mentioning in terms of people classifying something as well, that information isn't important. I think, unfortunately, when it comes to capturing the, when it comes to capturing the the full feeling of the human experience, if it can't be codified, and this may be looking at things through a very, um, maybe ardent scientific lens of if it can't be proven, it doesn't exist, kind of kind of thing, or, you know, but you said something there just in terms of if people say that that information isn't important, we have a we have a real habit of doing this when we don't understand something or we, we can't, we can't, uh, we can't take or stand in the place of perspective where we could potentially see what this means. And we've got almost this very dismissive way of just saying, well, that's not important. <laughs> you know, like e even sometimes, um, I had a Jungian analyst and we were just even mentioning this in terms of dreams. If somebody says, well, dreams are nonsense like that's <laughs> that's a big swathe of our existence to say that something is just nonsense or, or not not important well let me pick up on that dream thought i think it's a very beautiful one i think it's a really important one one of the things i've been ex sort of suggesting talking to people right now is to say i can fly i fly not in airplanes i fly i fly through the sky uh and i do it quite regularly and in fact i have done it since i was a child now, I'm not about to say, Mark, look, I'm going to flip the camera around and, you know, watch me take off from my third floor window here. But I've flown regularly in my dreams. So Robbie, this Robbiness, this, this, this sense of self in time and space 
has spent time where it's to all intents and purposes, phenomenologically in that moment, what I was doing was flying. Uh, and, yes. and sometimes it's been very, very beautiful and it's been very high. Sometimes it's very claggy and I can't get off the ground. But why prioritize this moment in time and space of my phenomenological relationship with the universe over that one? So as I say, to all intents and purposes, I fly and I fly quite regularly. And I do think that means something. I think it is meaningful. It's, it's, a, it's a good thought experiment worthy of inquiry. Because again, the, the fact that I am that person who thinks that that may cause various things to happen. I hope it doesn't cause anybody to think, yeah, well, you know, I will jump out the top of the third floor window. That's not what I'm saying at all. But yeah. in those moments, so I also, I, mean, I was back to pay attention. One of the things I've tried to do recently is to pay attention both to the the state i think it's called i might get them wrong but the hypnopompic state as one's going from waking into sleep and of course then we have dream sleep but then the hypnagogic state where you're coming out of that that beautiful space of out of dreaming out of sleeping into waking and those liminal spaces are incredibly rich and i i i've I think I'm, I don't know. I, I've been looking at, I haven't found it elsewhere yet. This idea of conceptual synesthesia where you, your brain is clearly doing so many more exciting things than one is normally conscious of. So I, I, I try and come up with a, with, with, with an example. Um, a, and I know this is a bit of a solecism to share dreams, but on this podcast, I would imagine that's all right. I swim long distance. I've done, not for a little while, but I've swum the English Channel in a relay. I've swum Lake Windermere. I've swum, you know, 10 hours at a time. I like swimming long distances. I, I, I like it. So I was on the back of a boat, the kind of boat that had kind of accompanied me across the channel. It got swamped with waves. And I saw this big wave coming. And I, it, I thought to myself, that's a Rubens wave, as in the painter Rubens. Now, Rubens is not famous for painting waves. And my embodied reaction to it was I was pleased that I was expert enough to spot that that was a Rubens wave. That was what was coming. So this strange mashup in my brain, my mind, of a wave and Rubens, in a way, probably in my waking day, I wouldn't have. There's this beautiful examples. And the more you pay attention, the more you breathe into that that stuff, record some of it. The more it happens, the more you do it, the more you start to see how incredibly beautiful and exciting. Now, you could also see how frightening it could be, because this could be, you know, an example sometimes of one's mind starting to run hot. And for people who for whom this gets out of control and it feels frightening, and there are voices and there are and those are those are real things. That is their phenomenological experience of being there in space and time with their up quarks and down quarks and muons and mesons and I don't, how low into the reductionist space you want to go. I, 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 I'll, you know, all of that is is also fabulous and amazing that we we start to know all of that. But dreams are fundamentally important. There's a there's a great book called um, Fool's Crow by Jack Welch, who is a Blackfoot, and he writes about the seamless way in which the Blackfoot. It's a story about you know the awful genocide really that was committed in America, particularly after the the the, the Civil War. Um, so the assault that was being made on the Blackfoot, who were there in kind of the northwestern part of Canada and, and America, and he writes about the seamless way they they movement between. Um, this world that you or I know we're in, our, we feel our waking world, the dream world and quest worlds. And if you and I had been on a raid and we, you know, taken horses from the Pawnee and you, f you, you had a dream in which I needed to give you the two piebalds that we, we took, I would give them to you. I would, because it had happened in your dream. It had caused something to happen. So to dismiss all of that as nonsense, as not mattering, as not as, as not as not mattering in terms of understanding who we are as humans seems to me to be hubris of a of, of, a, of a very particular a very particular kind uh and so when the claims that are made about what it means to know what it means to know anything at all what it means to be no be known what things are caused to happen i think we've got to be we've just got to be a bit more humble really about 
what what we know and what we don't know, which has been another big theme of what we've been talking about today. But there's, I, I think there's such a big part of paying attention, which requires us to truly pay attention or to come into contact with the moment. It requires us to to drop our labels, like it, you know, it, or it requires us not just to see the world, maybe even in terms of what we've seen before. It it also requires us. I I don't know. I, I have this experience. Maybe this will better explain what I'm trying to say. Sometimes I look up at a tree and I'll have this moment where I'm like, I just feel absolutely immersed with the visual of the tree. And then my mind has to kind of come in and say, oh my God, that's so beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> and and the moment my mind comes in and does that, I find that I've separated myself yeah. from, and it's not to say that either the mind will function and that's okay. And it's not to say one is experience is a good or a bad experience. But I think there are moments where we can truly be with the moment and pay attention to what is and take a glimmer of that back or an insight back into how we perceive maybe the same scene that we previously would have had labels to go constantly just thinking, well, that's a tree and those are branches and 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 so forth. So there's something I think about deeply paying attention that almost requires us to to kind of cease or or kind of hang our previous views or ideas about something like to hold them in suspension while we get a glimmer into something to potentially see a new perspective. Very beautiful. And I think, I think, I think that's a very beautifully succinct way of, 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 of putting it. I think it helps you, I suppose, neuroscientists might call about changing your priors, being aware that, you know, you, 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 you're resetting some things, you're resetting the lens, the way your brain takes the data, goes, aha, uh-huh, it's one of these, one of that, I get that. I'm not, I don't have to work that hard on it. And I think this is interesting. I think Carl Friston talks a lot about this, doesn't he? The free energy principle that if our brain has been evolved fundamentally to keep us alive in terms of, you know, keeping us out of harm and making sure that we manage the energy budget, the brain manages the body's energy budget on the right side of getting, keeping out of harm and getting the food we need. You know, it, it, it wasn't created to create Beethoven's Fifth or you know, the Mahabharat um, or, you know, cave paintings in Lascaux. Um, uh, but it does. But it's energy intensive. So there gets to be a stage where it is just easier to go. It's one of those. I know what that is. I don't need to work. But if your brain is consistently open to surprise, open to challenge, then that's tiring. And actually, from an evolutionary point of view, your brain go, your baby might go, no, it's enough of that. But if you're consistently open, I think it's tiring to be consistently open. Wonderful, but tiring as well. And I think it's why so many of us, and I would include myself, I don't, you know, said we 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 kind of go, I think I know what I know and I know what I think. And you discard all those other things which are maybe fleeting shadows, glimmers. So if I believe the world is run by lizards, there's really very little that you could tell me, Mark, you could try and persuade me that they're not, but I could say, look, they get to you, they do that. I know they do that. And actually, in a way, my brain is not having to work desperately hard because no piece of data comes in through my sensory motors into the Bayesian mass of my brain and goes uh, anything other than, yep, that's the lizards again. And and that's, you know, I manage my energy budget quite efficiently that way. So to be open to changing those priors, and I think this actually matters deeply in a civic discourse space. Uh, in a way, the the, the interviews you 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 saw me doing for Democracy Next, which is about how do we create the spaces in which we deliberate more together, to get effectively together as humans, where we're able to be with those other perspectives, but equally you know do the hard yards of where we do draw the lines and the boundaries. This you know back to the messiness and the complexity of who we are. Just, I know you've mentioned your your kind of love of history. Uh, you've kind of mentioned as well, even your ability or your your interest in observing your own life, reflecting on your own life, paying attention. But the, you know, I, I always love kind of looking at things on the micro and then kind of extrapolating that onto the macro. So you're a person that's paying attention that seems to be deliberately also trying to orientate yourself in a way in which, you know, you'll learn, maybe you'll learn something from your, your past and, and that's still a challenge, right? Like, you know, and I'm saying this completely from my experience as well. Um, what then gives you optimism? Because things change as well, right? Like it, it, we're in this kind of, 
it, the human experience is this kind of funny thing in that we find it quite hard to change, but then yet we're also prone to considerable leaps or changes. Um, what do you think would contribute to like more of this kind of more healthy or more constructive kind of civic discourse than, than what we're kind of falling into at the moment? I, I think it would be from, I mean, I'm deeply interested in this. I suppose in a way it's genuinely how we, what can we learn from history? How do we now hold these spaces in which we're able to be with the difficult conversation, be with other perspectives, be with difference. What are the rituals? What are the spaces? How are they facilitated? How are they stole? How are they held? What stories do you tell in them? All of those things. And I'm, 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 I'm in part, I'm involved as a senior fellow at the Cambridge program as well, the center for resilience and sustainable development. And I'm helping to get involved in a project there on the concept of deliberative space. What, how do we create better deliberative spaces to be with complexity and uncertainty? And these are really hard yards and it will not be solved in my lifetime. And it will, as I think, so I think in a way what I'm, again, one of the themes through what we've been saying, there's always going to be this tension. There will always be this dynamic creative tension between what is creative in us and what is destructive in us. And we've each got it and it can be there in a day it could be there in a lifetime. Somebody, you know, broadly has brought more death and destruction and pain in life, sadly, than other people do. That's absolutely true, manifestly true. Uh, I think. I think that's 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 you know that's not too judgmental to say. Um, for all the you know understandings and and so on that one might bring about historical context about why certain people did what they do or are doing what they're doing. But I think that's the the, the paying attention bit is the awareness of just what a struggle this is always going to be. It is going to be a struggle. It will always be a struggle. And hoping that it won't one day be, I think puts a burden on us. And in a way, taking that burden off, paradoxically then says, right, well, where, whatever my neck of the woods is, wherever my space is, whether it is I'm just going to be a great neighbor or whether I'm going to try and, you know, create a huge new global organization, which will, you know, be able to take on existing power structures, um, that you're trying to do it consciously to try and nudge that constructive dial and minimize the destructive. But I always say the two as a pair because they are a pair. Um, and and to try and hope that you know one or the other of them will ultimately prevail, or not hope. Obviously, one wouldn't want the destructive to prevail, but to believe and hope that the constructive will one day prevail, and it will be this space in which all is now always fluffy bunnies. I, I, I would say, I, anyway, from my perspective, I won't try and generalize and universalize. I've just been doing exactly that. But I would say. That <laughs> there we go. Paradoxes, paradoxes have abounded in our conversation so far. There yeah. we go. So say I, that that's where I've come to, and kind of that doesn't mean one shouldn't work one's socks off where one can to be on the constructive side. In fact, the the exact opposite. Um, yeah, but but I think even even that framework gives us uh, to me when you just said that it just it gave me a bit of space. Like I, I could this. Not a, like even we started off the conversation almost with a, an obsession with, um, you know, almost perfection or perfecting of our of our flaws. And even this idea, like, and also the pressure that that brings, like, you know, even when you were mentioning the, the idea of however anyone wants to frame it, even an experience with cancer, like if they want to use certain terminology, but it, otherwise it can just put pressure on people to behave and to show up to experience in, in a certain way. And I, I, I don't know, like I, I'm, I don't hold a, a utopia because I, I also think the, the world of just fluffy bunnies and everything else, like I, I think that would bring its own ills as well. Like there's something about this um, that just seems to be constantly moving. Like er, things are kind of constantly just within close enough reach for us to strive, uh, but maybe not close enough to us to grasp. And that's almost what we need as human beings to to move through these destructive periods as well. Even I'm talking about even just in our own inner journey at mm. times. Yeah. So I, I don't know. There's some, I, there's something really beautiful about just the, the elusiveness of, of where we're trying to go sometimes yeah. in life. And, and to be, I mean, I love fluffy bunnies just in case, you know, out there, you know, I love fluffy bunnies, <laughs> more for fluffy bunnies, and bring them on, but, but, but don't burden yourself with the belief that one day 
it's going to be, you know, fluffy bunnies all the way. Um, and I think of those, 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 those things that those burdens that I think we can put down and in putting them down, paradoxically, one is maybe likely to get slightly closer to that balance between being compassionate with oneself and the times where one needs to be tough on oneself as well. I think that 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 big paradox we've talked about of, of humility, and I think this is one of the great challenges morally, politically, philosophically for sapiens at the moment, is this paradox of how we celebrate ourselves at our most creative, constructive, and get over ourselves at the same time. And I'm a bit of a yeah. domain name junkie. And one of the domains I was pleased to register in lockdown was homohumilist.com. And it's the thought that with that radical kind of humility about being realistic about where we sit in a web of natural relationships, you know, whether it's the big climate change issues, whether it's C, whether it's other people, whether it's marginalized people, groups who've been excluded from discourse through the power structures. So when instantly, as soon as one plants sapiens as a whole, you know, you could actually start pointing the finger at certain groups of sapiens who really, really do need to get over themselves, but not to get over themselves and sort of come some I'm ever so humble, you're a heap kind of way, way Dickens, you're a heap, but actually the genuine creativity and and the chance to address these big things by that more realistic humility. And I'm I'm struck and I'm really careful about this because I'm aware, you know, I'm a white middle-aged Western man. But the for a number of First Nations people, they've always seen and have never lost sight of the fact that we exist in a beautiful, much wider web of relationship with animals, plants, trees, the procession of stars, which is worthy of respect. And there are lots of swathes of thought that have lost sight of all of that. And I think that's what I mean about getting over ourselves. Uh, Douglas Adams is on on record for the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy as saying that the the essence of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is that every species in the galaxy thinks they're more central to the story than they in fact are. <laughs> and again, that's that beautiful paradox. Yes, we do do wonderful things. We're capable of great kindnesses as well as our cruelties. But even, we, even within that context, there's a much wider web of relationship which we need to celebrate and acknowledge and be in. And if we do that with real humility, then maybe, maybe we're not Homo Deus, Pacho Yuval Harari, um, where you know, where, where, where maybe not sapiens, where we'll be dubbed Homo humilis, because we'll be the generations that discover that radical, unbelievable creativity that's unleashed by that kind of humility. Oh, that sounds absolutely gorgeous, um, Robbie. Just as I as I tend to to finish these conversations off with. Uh, it's with the question of, of what is a good life for you. I know we've touched on things like of paying attention, compassion for ourselves, humility, um, an appreciation for uncertainty and complexity um, and an attunement almost to nature and, a, and, a, and almost like an attunement as well to what's beyond just the material world as well or a curiosity of, of opening up to new perspectives, new, uh, new beliefs, uh, new possibilities as well. Um, but also holding this idea of just giving us a little bit of space and being somewhat cognizant of some, not the limitations of humanity, but just the, the push and pull between this creative and destructive uh, elements of ourselves and then on a, on a macro level as well. Uh, I'd just be super intrigued to hear your thoughts at the end of this of, of what is a good life for you, sir? Well, if I might, um, I'd offer another poem. Um, Please do. If that's all right. Um, and this is actually... A poem I wrote, in fact, for my uh, son's wedding a few years ago. And it was drawn from lots of, they'd asked, you know, lots of people for some advice. And I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's quite long. Um, but I'm just going to pick a few bits from it. Um, and this is about a couple, but I think it could be more generally extended. Look after your us and after you and I, be with the profound mystery of the other in your togetherness. On a glorious day, 
in which we each went our own way, yet never left each other. Amidst fiercer energy and passion, live life in the quiet places too, in the unregarded space of small kindness on unremarkable days, in the imagining of the lives of others. Find the fast flowing water where it runs smoothest over the big stones in endless streams of green liquid silk. Hike and sing in alpine meadows, climb every mountain, even the misty ones, with care. Swim in fast flowing rivers and cobalt cold lakes. Walk in wind and rain and sun and snow. Stroll along cliffs by the sea through woods in your dappled light. Be careful and patient in conversation when you approach a decision with different views, compromising with joy and respect. Never part in anger, part with loving words of energy for the day ahead. This is a very specific piece of advice, actually specifically for couples. Find a good Spotify list to dance to. Invest in a good pair of earplugs. Snoring will occur somewhere down the line. Both of you. <laughs> Have fun. Plan special moments, those glorious days that will last forever in your story. Some will happen by accident, others won't. Do something nice just because you can. Have each other's back, be back to back. And then there's a piece about uh, keep talking, do your best to listen and to truly hear. They are not the same. Try hard. You will not always succeed not to ask more of the other than they can give at this moment because they are tired or worried or distracted because their day has been disappointing because all they really need is a hug and a glass of Cote du Rhone. I am on watch now that you may sleep soundly, my dear. We shall take turns. There may be times on a darker sea when one of you will need to be on the bridge for many watches while the other cannot. Be so with grace. Enjoy the days of glorious sailing, the touch on the tiller, the wind on your cheeks, and water ruffled by wind. Weep and laugh with a sense of belonging and recognition of beauty in the world. And then hold the fragile in careful hands. Support in each other's success support in distress, support in ordinariness. There's some excerpts from the poem, which is as close as I've ever got to sort of pulling together some thoughts about what a good life might be. Oh, that was absolutely glorious, Robbie. Um, I, I enjoyed that absolutely immensely. Um, I've enjoyed this conversation with you absolutely immensely. And yeah, just thank you so, so much for taking the time with me here on, on the What Is A Good Life podcast today. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's been, that's been, this has been a real pleasure for me. Well, thank you so much, Martin. Thank you for, you know, reaching out. What a joy to meet you. And I really thank you very much indeed for allowing me to rattle on like this for this amount of time. It's very, very, <laughs> very, very, very generous of you. Thank you so much. <laughs>